Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him what he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your friend asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Sorry, your child asks for a fish, will give you a snake instead of a fish. Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. So when I, I wrote the sermon for this week on Monday, and of course after um, Pat and Deborah died, I decided let's go back and rewrite this thing, and I did. Um, but I noticed how much the readings today focus on faith, which is what I'm going to be talking about. You know, the question comes up often in my mind and often among folks who, who sit and read the Bible and think about it and ponder about it, about um, Abraham. Did he show faith by saying to God, oh, wait, 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 what about 45? What about 40? What about 35? And the answer is yes, of course. And Deirdre, you read that one O. It was like, oh, God, one more thing. How about 35? You hit that O perfectly. Well read. <laughs> because you can just see him like, how far can I go with this? And my Old Testament professor said, what if he had said one person? Would God have said, I will save them for one person? Did Abraham get a little bit like, oh, I'm pushing this too far? But, but this is part of faith that we live. So luckily due to the Holy Spirit, glorious Holy Spirit. Faith is part of the readings that we hear today. But what does faith mean? Goodness, how to answer that question. And to be clear, I'm not asking what does it mean to have faith or what does it mean to live a life of faith? These are secondary questions. These are questions we can ask after we've done a bit of digging in what the word faith actually means. Just as we're asked to sit with Jesus at the foot of the cross, or in the Garden of Gethsemane, or while he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, let's sit with this word faith. Let's give, some, let's give the same sort of love, attention, care, spirit that we give to Jesus in our prayers, in the Eucharist, in service to the poor. Let's give the same sort of love to this word faith. Let's listen to it. Let's hold it close to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Because that's the only way we'll really get to know what this word means. Now, when I was in grade school, I didn't know what a word meant. Well, when you were in grade school, you didn't know what a word meant. What did your teacher tell you to do? Look it up in the dictionary. You look up in the dictionary, and some fancy person in some office has written down their definition of what it is. And you have to write a sentence about it, right? Like, if you don't know what the word, that was a good one, eschatology means. You look it up, and you know, <laughs> those big words you get in second grade, right? 
And you look it up, you know, eschatology, okay, use it in a word. Um, God will be with us in the eschatology. Doesn't really demonstrate what the word means. But, you know, you try, you try. And later in life, if you don't know what a term means, the teacher might not say, go to the dictionary. The teacher or mentor might direct you to poets or authors or writers who are great in our tradition. How did St. Paul use the word faith? How does Jesus use it? How might Isaiah have used it? How does Michael Curry use it? Wordsworth, Shakespeare, Frederick Buechner, B Bishop Dee Dee Duncan Proby. These people who are miles wiser than I am, who see deeper into reality than I do, how do they use this word? But as we grow older still, we come to realize that words like faith, love, hope, words dripping with so much meaning that they fill the pages of a dictionary and then some, words like these can't be defined, they need to be lived. Because the person who teaches us the definition of words like faith isn't the writer of a dictionary, it's not Shakespeare or St. Paul. No, the one who teaches us about faith is the same person who taught the writers of the dictionary, Shakespeare, and St. Paul this word, and that's the Holy Spirit. During times of great tragedy, I'm often asked, how do you have faith in the midst of all of this? And some people are just curious about my faith, but most people, when they say, how do you have faith in all of this, what they, say, what they mean to say is, how do I keep faith in all of this? Sometimes this is asked in all honesty. Other times it hides the more painful question, I'm having trouble with my faith right now. Or it's difficult to have faith when things are horrible. And let me tell you, these questions are not sins. It's not a sin to struggle with your faith, especially in a time of tragedy. The word gospel means good news. Jesus' message is good news to a world that looks grim and lonely and horrible and terrifying, even on the best of days. It's hard to look at the world, especially the world today, and stand up and proclaim loudly that God loves us to the bottom of creation and back. The great, I don't know if I call it great, but the most used atheist cr criticism of Christianity is that no loving God can sit and watch what's gone on in the 20th and 21st century and still be loving, let alone the centuries of the world past. It's pretty easy to say that God is love when things are all nice, but it's pretty hard to say that when everything is going downhill and only getting worse. But we Christians still proclaim that God is love, and we proclaim it loudly in thought, word, and deed. And in some sense, faith is proclaiming that God is love in the face of much evidence to the contrary. Faith is in part knowing that we live in a broken system that makes the poor poorer and the rich richer, but still going down to the Samaritan Center and hold, helping just a handful of people. Faith is in part recycling and reducing plastics, even though seven um, straws every single week isn't going to make our um, stop the, you know, the oceans being filled up with our trash. Faith is in part loving people even though they hate you and your love will never change it, but loving them anyway. These things are part of love, living a life of a martyr, whether that is in life or unto death. And it's the only way to live a life of faith. And I'm sorry, it's not the only way to live a life of faith. There's more to it. Sometimes when we talk about having faith, we talk about it like faith is some muscle we can flex. Reminded of a great Calvin and Hobbes strip in which Calvin, see, you know Calvin and Hobbes, tiger and little boy. They both, uh, Calvin and Hobbes both see a firefly and Calvin just kind of goes like this and looks behind him and Hobbes says, if you're asking, if you're thinking of your, whether your rear end is lighting up, it's not. And Calvin says, I don't even know which muscle to flex. You don't have a faith muscle in your body. You know, we ask, how, how do I have more faith? As if faith is something we can accumulate, 
like having enough wood to build an ark like Noah to weather the storm. We oppose faith sometimes to reason, as if having, having faith means shutting our ears and closing our eyes to the truth that is really out there. And if we really looked at reality, then our faith would go up in smoke. Faith, though, is not blind faith. Faith is not ignorance. No, faith is more like love. You, you only know about it when you live it. So, for instance, you all love Christ Church. I know this very, I, I knew this like two months after I got here. You love this community and you love this building. But if I asked you, prove it, you might be kind of confused. And actually, I would expect you to be kind of insulted. You don't prove love, you live it. I learned about your love for this community by the tears you shed when the choir finally came back. Do you remember that? It was in like September, and suddenly the wonderful choir started singing. I counted a few, I don't counted a few wet faces that day because of how much you love our choir here. I don't know if you guys were crying in the, in the choir loft, but we were down here. Yeah, yeah, you still are. I learned about your love for this community when, Christ, when you threw your arms around one another, when we could finally relax from COVID a little bit, about how you bent over backwards to have coffee hour in the hot summer sun, just so you could start sharing your lives together again. Now, I think we should have coffee hour outside, but it's hot outside, isn't it? But we don't care because we get to be with each other and we get to love each other. And I learned a lot of your love for this building by how none of you ever get tired about talking about how much you love these windows. And you talk on and on and on and you still want to tell me more and tell me the same stories and it's wonderful. You talk about the steeple. Um, who is it who took that wonderful picture of the steeple? I don't think anyone here is today who had it. We, it was in the, in the stewardship community. I think it was Jim or Peter, it might have been you. Um, it was this wonderful picture of the steeple in, in like the dark light, but the setting sun was on it. And we were sending it around, I think it was a stewardship committee, and we're like, oh, this is beautiful. How can we use this? This is great. And you still love these, oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> Hi, Peter. <laughs> oh no, the two Peters are sitting next to one another. What are we gonna do? You never proved your love to me. You lived it, and I experienced it and I knew it. That's how love works. Faith is the same way. Faith isn't something you flex when things get tough. Faith isn't a net that will catch you if you fall off the high wire. It's not something you build up like a good credit score or that you practice like throwing a curveball. Faith is like love. It's something you live because faith is a gift that not that you receive, but that you share. Jesus Christ showed his faith by how he lived to the prostitutes and the tax collectors, the untouchables of society, the guys naked in the tombs who no one wanted to be around and who they had chained up. God, uh, Jesus lived to them in faith. He showed faith in preaching the good news of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you want evidence that it's okay to doubt and struggle with your faith for a little bit, there it is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus shows his faith in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he weeps as he walks forward. He shows it on the cross, where he still he prays for the people, the people who nailed him there, the same people nailing him to the hard wood of the cross, as he's dying, he's praying for these people. And he's thinking, how, how, what's my mother going to do after this? Hey, John, can you take care of my mom? That's what he's thinking about as he's dying. That's his showing of faith. And it's that same faith that is what saved us. You don't have faith. You don't store it up like treasures in heaven. You live a life of faith and you live it to one another. Faith doesn't save us from the tragedy of life. It brings us to the very heart of tragedy because we know that the best way to live a human life, a truly human life, 
is to give ourselves for the love and care of one another. Doubt in your mind all you want. Struggle with the cosmic questions of God. But when life comes crashing down, faith is that you seek out those most in need and heal them, even as you yourself are hurting. So I want to tell you a story that I don't, I've been thinking about for a long time. This is, didn't happen to me, well, thank, obviously, as you'll hear it. Um, and I don't usually tell this story just because I think I'm still working through it. It's a grim story. It's about Hiroshima. So in the hours after the nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in World War II, many people lay dying of radiation. Unfortunately, the people in the, in the middle were vaporized, literally. But the people kind of at the edges had burns all over their body um, and from, from the intense heat. And their, their, their throats were parched. <clears throat> Hundreds of thousands of people. They went down to the river to, to, to slake their thirst, but they couldn't. They just couldn't do it. Um, and I don't remember exactly why, but the, the destruction of the, um, of the city was making the water level rise. And these people who had gone down to the banks didn't have enough strength to get out because they just couldn't move their bodies anymore. But one man, no one special, just some guy who lived in the city, without any thought of himself or his burns, spent the whole night and into the next day pulling people out of the oncoming waves. In his pain, his fear, his trepidation, a city that looked like the end of the world all around him, this man spent all he had dragging people from death, knowing that they still might die, even though he dragged them away from the water, but still dedicating him to the tortured state that they were in and delivering them to salvation and caring for his human beings, fellow human beings. That's faith. That's what faith looks like living for the good of others, for the hope of others, not because we believe through and through the words of the creed or to stand on the firm and asserting faith that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. We don't live a faith of assertion. We live a faith of life. Faith is living in the midst of tragedy and saying, I don't care what the world says or looks like or acts like. I'm going to live love anyway, even if it kills me. Now, I hope and pray that none of you here or watching online have to go through what this man in Hiroshima went through or what Jesus did on the cross. But there are in our world and in our lives many, many opportunities to live a life of faith. We lived faith by coming together last Thursday to remember Pat and Deborah. I know many of you have lived faith giving up nights and weekends to visit folks in the hospital or to write emails, or to pick up the phone. And yes, living faithfully, coming and sitting in com um, committees and on vestry doesn't seem like living faith, but it is. It is. Living faith is living as if love means something, as if love and beauty and goodness and holiness aren't just fancy words we made up to make ourselves feel better, but things that can actually change lives for the better that can heal and rescue and save people and the great creation we live in. That's what living a life of faith is. Now we can talk about the creeds later. The creeds are important, don't get me wrong. Living love, though, is more important. Living love not just for the warm feeling inside of yourself, but living love for a hurting world. That's what it's all about. That's all it's ever really been about. That's how Jesus lived. That's how Jesus showed us to live. And that is the gospel that we proclaim. 